All right, I think I'm just going to get started and people can, can wander in and we'll see if anyone else wants to hear me give a spiel. Uh, my name is Patrick. I came here from New Hampshire. Um, <coughs> Yay! Hello, hello all. <coughs> and so on my talk, I'm going to cover a bit about the community in New Hampshire and how this is forming and what's going on there. Um, well, first I'm going to start with a bit with philosophy, then go into the community, and then why we got into Wi-Fi and mesh networking, and then where my research has led, and that's where I'm going to probably want more input from people that, you know, we'll go over what I have and we'll see what you guys have come up with yourselves. Um, so, decentralized New Hampshire. Um, humans have a problem. And uh, if we go back about, f you know, 5,000 years ago, we had these guys that dressed funny and they said that they were the gods and the, uh, and the rulers and that because they were gods, they, they could rule. And most humans are followers and they'll go along with that. And I'm sure back then there was someone just like us, that was like, no, that's not the way I want it. I want to build my own systems. I want to do it differently. And they said no, and you probably you know, got hurt and or killed if you, if you retaliated against their rule. But most people go along with it. <coughs> so I question, has much changed since then? Uh, we don't have pharaohs. We don't have people going around saying, I'm God, and therefore I'm government. Um, but that's what the pharaoh said. And for a while, there was emperors that said, you, you know, God chose me, and that's why I get a rule. Um, and then there was kings that said, God chose me and I get a rule, or God's messenger, the Pope, ch chose me and therefore I get a rule and I have a right to rule. Um, and nowadays, most places, there's some sort of, the people chose me. Some percentage, some group of people, often it's just an elite group of people, and therefore I have the right to rule. Um, but is that much different? Is that really the, f the future of humanity that we just vote, and if someone gets 25% of the people to say, you can rule over me. They can start making arbitrary rules and enforce them on us. Um, because that's still what's happening. It's the same thing as the pharaohs. You know, they want to build a, uh, a a sphinx. You know, the modern-day sphinx. I don't know what it would be. Uh, some monument to someone. And they take a little money from everyone. And if you don't want to pay, they send the police after you. And that's just not that much different than the pharaoh days. Um, and they're just getting rich just like the pharaoh did off everyone else's back. Um, so, what's happened in New Hampshire, and how does this relate to this 5,000-year history of humans kind of changing what we think about government? Um, <coughs> it's what I've called the Great Libertarian Migration. Other people have different names for it. But it's a new plan on how to fix this problem. See, the problem's been that in any group, you have the people that uh, reject the government, and then you have the, the majority that will just follow. They'll just go along with whatever the culture says. And if the culture says kill a bunch of people, they'll go along with that. We've seen this throughout history. Um, that people will just go along with whatever the government says. So it's a new plan. It's pretty radical. It's decentralized. Um, and it's an independent migration to New Hampshire. So people that look at this idea and go, yeah, I agree with that, can move from anywhere on the planet to this one location to kind of concentrate um, these uh, the free thinkers, basically. <coughs> and so I consider this the vanguard, kind of the front lines of, of this fight that's been going on for thousands of years of humans trying to stop oppression. Um, and so my community is just a bunch of people that are the same kind of people that rejected the Pharaoh's reasoning. You know, you don't get to just say that you get a rule over me. So liberty is, is the general term for this. What do I mean by that? Um, other terms that people might use are political terms like libertarian or classical liberal. Some people say anarchist, market anarchist. I like the term voluntarism. And that's what I'm wearing today. This shirt says love. This is the symbol for voluntarism. Um, the basic idea uh, of all these the at the core, it's the same thing. It's to maximize consent and minis minimize force, minimize coercion. Or other words, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. Um, pretty simple two rules that I think everyone can agree that governments don't follow that. Uh, it's, it's in their nature to hurt people and uh, not necessarily to intend to hurt people, but they want the money and they will hurt you if you don't give them the money. Um, so they hurt people and take their stuff. So <laughs> this says that, you know, the state's, oh I just said this, <laughs> the state is violating these rules. Uh, the consent of, of the governed, I think, is a facade. Uh, uh, some places it's worse than others. You know, some places have things like block voting, where you don't even get a say. It's just the, the most elite guy in your community gets the vote. Um, but it's all, all over the world. I think it's just a facade. It's, it's not real. I don't think democracy is a is a form of consent. Um, it might be like for the 
90% of the people that voted for him or for all the followers, the believers, they might believe in their head that they consented. But if they, for a moment, said no, it would be obvious that, that it was not a voluntary exchange, that this is coercion, that, that the government will come after you. <coughs> so where does this all come from? Um, a common response I, I get people, oh, you just hate, you have a lot of hate in you and you hate all this stuff. And that's definitely a stage I went through when I was thinking about this stuff. I thought, wow, I'm really angry now. I'm very angry that this is, you know, the way I thought the world worked and the way I was told it worked doesn't seem to be the way it actually works. And yeah, I did get angry. Um, and I did hate those people, but you work beyond that. Um, or maybe is the U.S. that bad and it's better everywhere else? Um, yeah, I think it is pretty bad in the U.S. It's a very productive economy and productive economies, they tax the people. Uh, unproductive economies that have natural resources, they don't need the people at all. So you go to a place like Saudi Arabia and they just need oil. And they can sell the oil and they can be in power because of the oil. They don't care if the people produce a bunch or not. But in the US, the government needs people to produce and they take that money and then they fund wars and a bunch of other, you know, the good with the bad, but the good I think can all be done without the bad. And that's the whole point of this uh, migration, <laughs> is to see if we can actually do it. And this really all comes from empathy. Empathy is the idea that in our, well, this is how I view it, um, that in our head we can simulate situations. And the more you practice it, the better you get at it. So just like someone playing basketball can kind of watch someone else playing basketball and right as the ball leaves your fingers, the guy that's really good at it knows whether it's going to go in or not. Um, it's like that with empathy. The more you do it, the more you can realize how people would be affected by, by force. Um, so I think it's the ability to, Imagine yourself in someone else's situation, or just imagine that situation, and kind of feel the same feelings that they would feel. Um, and this is key to communicating and relating to others, and I think it's key to liberty. It's key to wanting other people to be free, because I want to be free. <coughs> so I think the logical consequences of, of empathy is that if I don't want to live in a world where people commit fraud, assaults, and threats against me, uh, then I can empathize with, with others and commit myself to peace and to fighting against these issues. And centralized government is simply incompatible with this worldview. I'll say centralized government because right now we have nation states. Um, in the past, there's been city states, empires, all sorts of other things. Uh, right now, the world's full of a bunch of nation states, more, th more than ever. There's like almost 200 now. Um, so that's kind of good. They're getting smaller. They're getting more decentralized, uh, but they're not decentralized. And really, the ultimate would be to decentralize it down to the individual. What do you consent to? Not what did your whole, you know, 50% of your community consent to? Even if it's 100 people, it's still not your consent. And that's that's really consent is from the individual. <coughs> and I swear this is going to go towards mass networks at some point. Uh, so there's this migration idea. So I moved to New Hampshire from San Diego. Um, I heard about this idea that called the Free State Project about maybe five years ago or so. And a little history on it. In 2001, uh, some guy wrote on some blog online and said, hey, what if we did this? And some people read it and said, wow, that's a really good idea. That actually could work because uh, nothing else is really working. Um, or rather, it's just going too slow for people. And they want it, na they want it in their lifetime. You know, think about all the humans that have fought to be more free and you know, they die and they don't really achieve. Maybe they achieve some extra freedom in their lifetime, but um, not full decentralization, not consent down to the individual. Um, so the, the idea was to uh, get 20,000 people to sign and commit to move to New Hampshire. And when, they, when you hit that, to move, that all 20,000 would move or as many as are alive and able. Um, and this really would be the first decentralized migration because whenever migrations happen, it's displaced people or it's people trying to follow food or doing something like that. But it's a group, it's already a community moving. Um, and this is not like that at all. This is people around a philosophy moving to one place, coming from anywhere on the planet. Um, <coughs> so I really, I think it's the first decentralized migration that kind of, the decentralization also goes into the mesh part in a bit. But uh, so in 2004, they chose New Hampshire. Uh, in 2007, a bunch of people said, well, I don't want to wait until 20,000 people sign. I'm going to move now. And about 1,000 people moved. So that happened. And 2016, 20 they hit the 20,000th signer. So it took 15 years to reach the goal. Um, so it's been a big project. 
And in 2018, uh, well, I moved last year, but now at 2018, there's about 3,000 people that have moved total, and we welcome about 25 new people each month. Uh, these people are uprooting their whole families, they're you know, getting new jobs, selling houses. It's, it's not easy to migrate. Uh, at least it's intentional. You know, at least it's on our terms. It's not war displacing us. It's not all these other kinds of unfortunate migrations going on. So why did New Hampshire get chosen? Well, it's got a go low cost of living relatively to other places in the U.S. It's got a great quality of life. Like, you know, people have all sorts of polls on this thing. And New Hampshire is regularly in the top three for quality of life. Uh, it's got a mix of cities, country, mountains, and sea. Uh, it has an international border with Canada. It has the most highly representative government in the world. And now I was just bashing democracy. But if you want to get stuff done, it's better to decentralize as much as possible. So each representative represents about 3,000 people, um, as opposed to, say, California, where it's something like 50,000 people. So that's, and that's, if you look at world governments, as far as I've seen, that's the most representative government in the whole world. Uh, it's about 500 representatives to just over 1 million people. Um, it also is very low taxes already, no income tax, no sales tax. <coughs> and the culture generally is one of distrust of the government, of the state. So they've been able to keep it in check much more than other states in the United States. And the state motto is live free or die, which comes from uh, the Revolutionary War times. And it was also a motto used in France and uh, throughout the world during the Enlightenment period, just to mean that you got to fight for your freedoms and there's no point in being a slave. So live free or fight for it. <coughs> and so the natives there have also been voting libertarian, which is the political party in the U.S. that more or less espouses this ideology. So they've had high votership uh, for libertarians for quite some time. But what is actually happening in New Hampshire? So there's all sorts of political action. Is, and this is, this is the key to the migration, too. It's, it's decentralized in that once you get there, it's totally up to the individual what they want to do to try to further the movement. But we all took a pledge not just to move, but to do the most we can to achieve liberty in our lifetime. doesn't say how you do that. People do it in different ways. There's all sorts of political action. So there's, uh, I think right now, probably two dozen or so people affiliated with uh, this freedom movement, with this migration, that are currently holding office. Um, but there's also people running programs like New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, where every law that goes through New Hampshire gets, and, and every uh, senator or House representative, gets a piece of paper that says exactly what this philosophy says about that law so that they can go, okay, like this, this is what these people think about this law, and it's for every single law. And there's not really another group of people with, that hold a philosophy like this so dearly that they do this kind of thing, because it's all volunteer. Uh, there's jury rights, where people are going out and telling juries that, that they don't have to convi convi convict people of, uh, of like drug crimes, victimless crimes. Again, along with the philosophy, victimless crimes. Uh, such as, you know, when a cop says you can't do marijuana, and so they take you to court, and the jury thinks that they have to follow the law. But um, in the U.S., at least, a jury can just say that law, we don't like that law, so we're going to say he's innocent. Um, <coughs> and then there's all sorts of community action. Uh, there's a libertarian social space, like a bit like this one. Uh, potlucks, move-in parties. We have market days that are like flea markets. Uh, we encourage entrepreneurship, so people are always trying to start new businesses, and you know, people. A lot of people come there, and they don't have a lot of money. They spend all their money getting there. So, uh, entrepreneurship is a big part of the community. Get a job, start a job, do something, build something, create value, and then we particip participate, of course, in the local groups because we don't want to be isolated. We want to be, uh, we want to affect the culture of this of New Hampshire as well. So, another huge thing that's happening in New Hampshire is cryptocurrency, which is a decentralized form of money you guys probably have heard of. Uh, there's companies such as Library, Swarm City, and AnyPay that are based in New Hampshire. Uh, Lamas, who used to be based in New Hampshire. Uh, there's people promoting cryptocurrency worldwide on Free Keen, Free Talk Live. Um, there's a cryptocurrency-only store in Portsmouth where you can only spend cryptocurrency. They won't accept any euros or dollars at all. You can pay in almost any cryptocurrency, but <laughs> you, you cannot pay in dollars. Um, and also in Portsmouth, there's an educational institute called the Blockchain Institute of Technology. And they teach people how to use cryptocurrency, uh, how to code for cryptocurrency. Uh, 
what other type of things are happening? The Dash DAO, I don't know if anyone's here familiar with DAOs, they're decentralized autonomous organizations, basically how the blockchains are ran. And the Dash has quite a, I don't want to say, say complicated, but a powerful DAO, because a percentage of all the miner fees goes towards the DAO, and the DAO can spend it on uh, marketing, it can spend it on development. And so I know people that work for the DAO, they don't, you know, that's their boss is the actual network. Um, and then also the DAO fun stuff. So uh, being that this community is quite interested in, in uh, cryptocurrencies, the DAO has funded uh, a number of libertarian events in New Hampshire, such as Liberty Forum, Porkfest is next month, and the Free Coast Festival have all been, uh, but they're also doing this worldwide. It's not just in New Hampshire. The DAO is funding all sorts of things like this. And there's a bunch of businesses. So I can pay my rent in cryptocurrency in New Hampshire. I can, I can buy chocolate. I can, like I said, I can get courses on how to code. I can do all sorts of stuff um, for crypto. So is Mesh happening in New Hampshire? Uh, there's been a lot of talk. I just moved there a year ago, and uh, right away people, you know, I, I, I've heard people talking about it, but it's just not a thing right now. It's obviously a community that's into decentralization. Um, there is a bit of an active Gotenna community. So over the summer, uh, uh, quite a few people were buying them and I got gifted some, uh, some other people got gifted them. So I think there's a few dozen people that have Gotenos, but Gotenos only go a mile or so if at, in best case scenario. Uh, we were testing them actually last night and it was, it was spotty, but I think that was my phone, not the antenna. <laughs> um, so I'm actually not close to any Gotenos except for my wife to communicate. <laughs> um, uh, but we're going to be at Porkfest next month, and we'll have a few dozen there. And so at a festival, we'll all be able to use them. And that, that'll be an interesting experiment. Um, and I've created there a list of people uh, that are interested in hosting nodes. And it's, it's in the dozens as well, uh, people that have property, people that have the money. And they, they say, I want to buy a node, or I want to host a node. Maybe I have a house, but I don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, but you can put it on my roof. And so, at least in the community I'm in, in West Manchester, there's a lot of people already signed up and saying, once you get this going, we're ready to have you put it on our roof um, or in our window. <coughs> but really, I wanted to know if the time was right. So that's why I started looking into this. I was like, where is the technology? Um, kind of did a little bit about me. I'm from San Diego. I think authority sucks. I think aggression sucks. I got into Liberty, moved to New Hampshire. Now I'm into Mesh. That covers it. <coughs> Uh, so an, a friend of mine showed me an article on Mesh Networks and it was on, uh, it really was showcasing the, the Mesh Network in um, Spain, Gihunet, and Cuba is called, I think, SNet, and the New York City, NYC Mesh. Um, and it didn't really mention any possible reasons for those locations, why this was happening there. And I was kind of curious, like, why does this happen in certain areas? So I started thinking about it. Um, I did notice that they kept saying Spain, and it really wasn't Spain, it was Catalonia. Um, so I was wondering if there was a link on why people create these type of networks. Um, came up with some ideas on possible reasons, but it's not really my field of expertise, so I just kind of stopped there. But I thought they were interesting. So I have noticed that there's always an interest in technology. You've got to have someone that's tech savvy to even get this kind of thing off the ground. Um, for me, it's just part of the whole decentralized all the things philosophy. Let's just get it everything decentralized, our money, our decisions, our networks, everything. Um, for some people, it's oppression. So in Cuba, I think, without a doubt, it's just a lack of information, of access to information. They had to build their own network to even communicate and access. Um, and for others, uh, it might be kind of related to that control, uh, where outsiders control the network. So for instance, in the US, I'm using you know the internet, and it's highly controlled, it's highly watched. Um, so I want something else. Maybe there's, uh, maybe at the end we can talk about other things people think might be uh, their reasons for getting into this type of thing. For me, really, it's all of the above. I feel a bit oppressed. I don't like the control, decentralize it, and I'm a bit tech savvy and I like the technology. Um, so the Free State Mesh Net, it was really just an exploratory group. So when I think when people saw it, they're like, how's your network? I'm like, it's not a network. It's just a group of people looking into building a network. Um, so that's why I'm here, to look into whatever everyone else is doing and learn from you guys. Um, but my goals were to create an attack-resistant communications network. So I think if, if anyone, I mean, without a doubt, my philosophy creates enemies, and those enemies are powerful. So if anyone wanted to attack me or my community, I would want another route to communicate, to uh, get the information and whatnot. Um, I also think by looking at these communities, they, they, they enhance community. They create more community. Um, 
and there can be useful and fun services. For some people, I've, I've heard it's, it was really about just getting internet connection to a certain location. Um, so I had a goal of, can we, get, can, can, we, can we create a better ISP, or at least one we like more? <laughs> um, and can it have good coverage? Uh, can we decentralize the capital, meaning like I don't own all the nodes, but obviously part of the mesh theory is that everyone could, anyone can join the, n the network and own their own node. Um, will it, would it be cost effective? And I think I already mentioned that I wanted to enhance the actual community. So I didn't want it just for the libertarians living in New Hampshire. I wanted it for the whole community in New Hampshire, or in my part of New Hampshire at least, to start. Um, so questions we put together was, is the tech is the tech even there? like, Or is it just really kind of a novelty at this point? Um, I think you guys all show that, that your communities that work, the tech is there, it's possible. Um, maybe it's a bit of novelty, but it's it's definitely possible. Um, and then we're looking at, is there better technology around the corner? You know, what's where are all these projects going? Which projects have been aren't being developed anymore, maybe even, even if they're being used? Um, what are the legal and regulatory concerns? Uh, can this be capitalized was a question. You know, can, can this kind of network be used to make money either for sustainability or just to kind of run a business? Um, and should it be capitalized? Would the goals, would all those goals be better accomplished uh, without monetizing the system? Or, you know, instead of a company installing a bunch of nodes, just having a nonprofit, kind of what maybe like what NYC Mesh does, or not having anything at all and just having it be entirely decentralized. And then what kind of services would fit these goals and fit this community was a big question, because ISP is only one of those. So the area that we're working in is called the Merrimack Valley. There's total about maybe 400,000 people living in that valley. It's the area of from the border with Massachusetts up about an hour and a half. So this is just outside of Boston, kind of a Boston suburb. A lot of people drive into Boston to work. Um, in particular, I'm in one of the three cities, the biggest, Manchester, and I'm on the west side. Uh, it's important that it's in a valley, at least as far as like networks go, because there's not um, not a lot of hills, because Mount New Hampshire has a ton of hills and mountains, but the valley doesn't, So and it has high hills on the sides, which is good. So it's fairly dense, it's a suburb, decently high hills, and there's only a few tall buildings. Um, most of the buildings are two to three story wood buildings, not s concrete and brick like New York has to deal with. Um, and they're not a thousand stories tall like New York, <laughs> New York has to deal with. Uh, and then the few very tall buildings are all on the other side of town and they're like on the other side of the valley. So the buildings kind of like look at each other and face each other in a stadium type fashion, which I think will be good for, for that. And uh, some of those buildings are lit with fiber, which is good. Uh, here's a view of the the physical area that we're we're in. So I'm over there on the west side, <laughs> and this is the east side, and that's Manchester in the Merrimack Valley. In particular, this is like a view from the top of a building on the east side, looking at the west side. I live right by that church right there, and as you can see, like you can see all the rooftops, windows, and so those are where the lit buildings are, and they all face here. So I think the idea of having a wireless ISP through the mesh network at least is very possible in that area. Um, so the people involved, I'll skip this one because we kind of already went over it, are a bunch of libertarians. <laughs> uh, can this be monetized? Should it? Maybe not. Um, is there technology that would allow this? Uh, question to be decentralized, like could each person choose whether to monetize their node? So I don't have to choose for them. Again, decentralize all the things. Can we bring this down to the individual level? These were questions we were asking. And uh, you know, is it an option to run more of a traditional wireless ISP alongside a mesh network? Can we do both? Um, can one be a company and one be a community and they just, you know, the company is servicing the community? And then we looked into incentivized nodes, which is kind of a, I think, maybe a newer concept or maybe just more possible now with, with uh, cryptocurrency. So incentivized net mesh nodes, uh, as I see it, are mesh networks in which nodes are compensated for the routing that they do. Um, this could be done for free. So I could have a node that's running the same software and I just saying I route for free. And you say you route for a penny and you route for two pennies. Um, and really for this, you need a very scalable cryptocurrency and that doesn't exist right now. Um, which, so the, the tech isn't there on that. There's just there's just no way to do it with the current cryptocurrency technology. You'd have so many transactions. Um, so 
but it's around the corner, right? Like, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, so what are the benefits of that? Would it aid the sustainability of the node owners? Would people be like, okay, well, I can, I have now a motivation to keep this up, keep it on online because I get paid for it. Um, and I want to build more maybe now. So maybe it would create more rapid network growth if they saw some benefit from this. Um, would it aid adoption? I'm not sure. I sometimes have the idea that people value more things that they pay for versus things that they get for free. So maybe people would think, okay, you know, whereas if you maybe say it's free, they think, oh, it's probably not that good then. Um, but if you charge 50 cents, they'd be like, oh, okay, I'll pay for that and see, check it out. Um, so those are things that I don't know. They're just questions we're asking, but um, as we move forward, w we might try it and see if it works out, and maybe next year I'll be letting you know what happened. Um, as we were looking into this, I, I came across a project called Althea. Has anyone here heard of Althea? Althea? Anyone here heard of Althea? A few people? Okay. So Althea is a, uh, they're using Babel, and they currently have software, uh, so it's not vaporware, whereas, so this is, this is one of the few cryptocurrency projects to do an incentivized mesh network. Let me get that out there. There's about 15. I wrote off 10 of them as either scams or just not worth looking into. Um, and then of the few that seemed promising, uh, it was one of them was here, Next Mesh, Right Mesh, Smart Mesh. Um, they were just total vapor right now, and they were doing a ICO. So they were trying to make a cryptocurrency uh, to basically get money to develop it. Uh, Althea was the one that I don't know where their funding's coming from. I heard that they uh, they're working at it with university funding, but I haven't verified that. So they're not trying to necessarily create a company right now. They're just trying to create the product. Um, they appear to be working on a hardware solution as well. Uh, which I think is important, at least with some of these devices maybe being a bit more locked out. Um, they're open. You can find them on Git, so they're not they're not closed source. Um, and right now they're doing it, they're testing it with Ethereum network, but Ethereum doesn't look like it'll scale, at least not well. We'll see. Uh, but it seems that the, the actual idea should be pretty crypto coin ag agnostic. It doesn't seem that it should matter which currency it is as long as it can scale and has some sort of uh, smart contract because these routers have to tell each other more than just send money but rather send a contract of, you know, I'm going to pay you this and you're going to route stuff back to me. And if you don't, you don't get paid. <laughs> um, so then there's a few projects that are doing this and are working on the scaling issue. Um, so Althea was interesting. And I'm going to switch to quick video here. We'll watch just a few seconds of it and see if you guys agree. Oh, I had it open and now I can't. There it is. All right. So I went forward a few because he starts the video and he doesn't even have them on yet. <laughs> but what we're looking at here is, is a few of their demo units uh, with a readout screen there. And... Uh, they are currently paying each other for routing. So here they're turning on. We don't have it because it's not coming up now. I think I have to take the PowerPoint off full screen first. No, wow, that's weird. Because the video, the screen just supposed to be duplicated. <laughs> that's obviously not doing it. That didn't do it either, did it? All right, we'll drop out and then I'll pull it back up. All right. So here are some units. And I don't know if we'll get the guy talking about it. But it's not that interesting to look at, uh, you know, because they're just going to keep doing this. But the concept's, I think, really interesting. So uh, right now, this one's the cheaper one to route across. This guy is trying to get to this node. And so this guy's too expensive. So he's not getting any of the routing. Um, the software uses two different uh, kind of metrics. is both quality of the, the routing and then the price of the routing. So you could have your quality setting saying, I'm willing to pay more for better routing um, and then pay more. So now he's he switched it and, and now this one's cheaper and it's doing the routing. Um, pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> like I said, uh, I don't think the currencies would let this scale right now because that's a lot of... Uh, transactions, but in the next two years or so, I, th I think some of these cryptocurrencies will figure out the scaling issue, and, and this will work quite well on a large scale. He'll also show a bit later, if you guys 
check out the project uh, introducing another node and turning nodes off and how they automatically will reroute to the nodes that are on so that they are meshing. So, wow, video. Okay, so we do have a little bit going. So I have I have two nodes. Uh, they are they just have uh, open WRT right now. They see each other, and that's all I did on that because as I was looking into the software and the hardware, I'm like, I just need to do so much more research, and I don't really know enough about about this stuff to to jump into it. So it's been interesting watching all you guys work on these routers because that's the stuff I, I did it for a few days. I was like, oh, man, I need to like sit down with someone else and see how they do it and just go through it more. Um, and we've been concentrating a lot more on like how, how would this actually roll out um, and then researching the services that might be useful to the company or to the community has been um, pretty big. And then just, you know, it's always hard getting people together. I said earlier, there's a saying, at least in my community, that it's like organizing cats or herding cats, rather. Uh, cats do not want to go together, and getting people to work on projects like this can sometimes be like that, hurting cats, especially these individualist, free-thinking types. Um, <coughs> so I want to talk about services. Obviously, Internet access is a big service that a lot of these networks, I'm sure your networks, are, are providing. Um, so that's the big obvious one is being an ISP. Uh, will people want to get c compensated for any services, ISP or other? Um, would they want to donate the Internet access? Uh, is there fiber was one of the questions we had, and that's yes, some of the buildings in the area are lit, and that was all thanks to the government. Uh, <coughs> and like I said earlier, all these lit buildings appear to be on the, the east side. Uh, what are some useful and emergency services was a question we had. Uh, so instant communication was one that I thought people might want is chat. Another thing would be uh, kind of emergency services. Uh, like emergency notification, like something's going on, there's a fire in the area, or there's you know, some kind of emergency, you want to get the message out to the com community. Um, other forms of communication might be down. Would this one be up and be useful in that way? Uh, social service, or like social app services, so just not instant communication, kind of like you know, post something and leave it out there. Uh, games could be played on the network. Uh, events can be listed on the network, and then it's for that local area. And then a big one for me was knowledge repositories. If you get cut off from the internet and you want to know how to do something, uh, I rely highly on other people via the internet to learn anything. So getting wiki, TED Talks, maybe Git, uh, Open Maps, various things on there was were, were ideas that we had uh, and, and are looking into. So as far as uh, instant communication, um, I think there's quite a few existing open chat solutions. I don't know how exactly they would work on the mesh. I I think it would be kind of just like on the internet, but uh, you guys can let me know what you guys think about that after this. Uh, as far as emergency, I'm talking to, or I uh, want to talk to the creator of Cell Phone One. He's the guy that used to live in New Hampshire, and Cell Phone One is a great tool. It's an app on iPhone and Android that anyone here can download, and then you get together with your friends, or say, Seabase, and if there's ever an issue, uh, <coughs> you can rely on those people, as opposed to maybe government uh centralized services that might be far away, they might not actually care about you, so they're like, whatever, I'll take my time. Or um, You can actually rely on your friends and family uh, and notify them that there's an issue. So this happened uh, with me, I was being, uh, I've only had to use it once, so but it worked perfectly. I was being hassled by the cops, and so I pulled out my phone, and there's a button on there, police interaction, uh, that I don't like, I never liked those. Um, so I clicked the police interaction button, and within a few minutes, five different people from my cell uh, were right there. They got a notification that I had a police interaction where I was. They walked over, and they're all on the west side of Manchester, and they were able to film the cops, and the cops more or less left me alone, stopped hassling me at, at that point. <coughs> so that's a service that I would like to have available even if the internet goes down, because right now it's only on the internet. Um, then you could imagine if there's something like social unrest somewhere that the internet might be cut off, and then you're thinking, you know, because the internet, the governments can c often control that, you know, or at least they control the companies that control the internet in the area, and they can cut it off. Uh, so having that on a local network to me would be important. Uh, we looked at social platforms. Uh, Movem was the one I looked at, uh, but I've heard here this week in Mastodon, so I put that in there in case anyone else is looking at services. Um, and then we looked at peer-to-peer -peer stuff, uh, stuff that could work, uh, services that could work uh, 
even without the mesh network, where the mesh, the mesh network's just one of the ways that you're getting it. Uh, and so that led me to uh, what I think was one of the most exciting things in this research, uh, secure scuttlebutt. So I am going to get into kind of a different part of this talk of uh, the services. What is secure scuttlebutt? Who here has heard of sc secure scuttlebutt? All right, a few people, cool. Um, so the basic idea is that uh, is gossip is like the, uh, the normal way, one of the normal ways humans transfer information. I tell you something, you tell someone else so that, and you know if it's information you want to relay, you relay it through gossip when you see them. Um, however, gossip can have the problem that, so there's an event going on, I tell you about it, you think it's cool, so you tell him about it, you tell think it's cool, you t tell him about it, but it might be by the time it gets to him, this guy's like, I actually forgot where it is and when it is, and then he says, it's, I think it's Tuesday at 5, but it was Monday at 10, and you missed the event. So gossip has this problem of the, int the, the information can get mutated as it goes out and uh, become basically a rumor. It's not really true. Um, so can you address the gossip problem with tech? Can we gossip over technology, and can we fix the rumor problem where the information gets? Um, so yes, and so Secure Scuttlebutt uses cryptography. It builds a chain, basically, um, of all my gossip. So I would have my gossip in a chain, and then if you're a friend of mine, you can verify that any of the gossip you got from me, whether it was from me or from a third party, uh, was actually from me, and it's something I said. Um, so, you guys might, someone might know this guy, this is Dominic, um, I don't know him, uh, he lives on this boat down in New Zealand, and he was here and actually talked about gossip in, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was at Seabase, but in Berlin in 2016 at the Decentrali at Decentralized Apps, DAPS conference or something like that. Um, I didn't go to it, but I was doing research into this, I found out that he was in Berlin a couple years ago. So, uh, he says Scuttlebutt is actually the water container on a ship, so it's like your water cooler. So that's where the gossip happens, right? People go to the water cooler, they get some water, and they, they talk about things. Um, and it makes sense because he lives on a boat, so why not call it that? Uh, so <laughs> the scuttlebutts of today, what are they? Um, he calls them pubs in Secure Scuttlebutt. And uh, basically these pubs, can you can choose to have them just broadcast peer-to-peer. -peer. So imagine there was a server, a pub here in Seabase. Uh, when you come to Seabase and you connect to that server, it would transmit to you all the gossip from all your friends. Um, and But uh, it could also be on the network, on the mesh network, or it could be broadcast to the internet as well. So there's different ways you could subscribe to the pub. Um, and then once you have the gossip, you go out to someone else and you can have a peer-to-peer -peer from your phone to their phone, your laptop to their laptop, and transmit the gossip as well. So the... Basically, I think Secure Scuttlebutt is, is something that's uh, complementary to uh, mesh networks and also accomplishes the goal of further decentralization. Uh, for anyone interested, this is uh, Cell411. It's a website. So get cell411.com. And I wanted to go to... So this is the Scuttlebutt apps. So it's... It's software today, you can use it. Um, and there's a few different apps already built for it. And I've done a little bit of testing and it, they work. Um, so <laughs> here's Patchwork. Patchwork is uh, is on the secure, so secure Scuttlebutt's like the protocol and Patchwork's a program to work on it. Um, it, it says right here, it's, it's built on top patch core, so which is like a reference program. And so this is kind of a uh, social view. So you have a wall, a feed of all your friends that you subscribe to, um, but you're not getting this data from any centralized server. Uh, so and th this is another one. It's still the social view, but it's just a different layout. So he built a few different versions. This is like a text only version of it um, on H using HTML. Uh, here's a minimized version of it. Here's a mobile version of it. Here's his first version of it, Patchwork Classic. And this is one of the interesting apps for it, chess. So if anyone's played correspondence chess, that's the idea. You make a move, I send a letter to you via the mail or something, or and I tell you what move I made, and then you make it on your board, and you make a move, and then you send a letter back. That's correspondence chess from afar. Uh, so you could play a game like that on here and just add to the gossip what your moves were. 
and every time you go to Seabase or every time you meet that friend or a friend of that friend, you get the update of what their move was. Uh, Book reviews is another app they have on here. Long form articles, so blogging. Uh, Ferment is sharing music, so you can like if someone's a musician and they're putting files on there. Um, so it's kind of showing that they could be. Um, so this is using WebTorrent too, so it's not the whole file isn't in the gossip. So you send the gossip when you see the musician or their friend and, and they get information about where the music is uh, via Ferment. And a Git on SSB, Scooter Scuttlebutt, and then a Events app, and then another thing to visualize the, uh, your friends. So there's a number of different apps I think maybe some people here might be interested in uh, using Scuttlebutt. And it's got a fun, funny name, too. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up with a few other services that I found that I think people might be interested in. Uh, Sandstorm is is kind of an interesting one for people that maybe aren't uh, that techie that might be in your group and they want to run some kind of service, either for themselves or for other people in the network. It has a simple interface, a large app store. Uh, basically, you can click on, I want to install WordPress. I want to install this chat service. I want to install this etherpad, I want to do this and just click it and they install and they start running. Um, another really interesting one is Kiwix and Kiwix is actually you can use Sandstorm to install Kiwix but you can obviously install your own Kiwix server. Uh, it uses a file format called Zim to wrap up and uh, like things like Wikipedia um, and so you can mirror these knowledge repositories on your network in a very simple way. Uh, you just download one file, you can set it up to download updates to the files, and then you have a completely update in your language copy of maybe Wikipedia, Stack Exchange, Project Gutenberg, um, and just a bunch of other things that are in this ZIM file format. And so that's taking things that you normally can only access via the internet and making sure you have a up-to-date local copy for your community. And that's the end of my talk on this. I will pull up real quick uh, Kiwix so you guys can see it. Here's Kiwix. Uh, this doesn't really show you what it looks like when you use it, but basically when you use it, it looks just like Wikipedia or just like Project Gutenberg. Just it's not really a wiki. You can't edit it. It's not live. It's just a view-only copy of it. All right. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, <laughs> that is what we're up to in New Hampshire. Um, any questions or comments, mainly, probably? My name is Deborah, and my question is related to the the way that because you moved in like last year or one year ago, so how how did you build the the, the community that is supporting you and this movement? Like it was not clear for me. It seems that there was a this migration, but now is you had friends or is something that you are building from? Yeah, so I just jumped into it. When someone moves, they're jumping into a community of 3,000 people already. Uh, in West Manchester, there's probably a few hundred of us um, that have all moved there for the same purpose. Yeah. So we have these welcome parties every month, and each month there's about five to 10 people at it, and they just jump right in, and we instantly have a few hundred friends. Um, and now I know, I, locals think it's weird, because I know people all throughout New Hampshire, like, how do you know anyone out there? You just moved here from San Diego. and it's because we hang out together <laughs> and, and then we're online together and whatnot. Um, but yeah, basically you jump into a big community when you get there. And a lot of them are tech savvy so people that are into the this. The big uh, place where you meet is this, this party thing. Or do you have like a gathering just to talk or it's just more about having together and talking and meeting people? Sure, without sure. Without any structure or methodology being? Both probably. So there's, you know, I've got friends in the community um, that hang out with otherwise and then we have a community space like this there's actually a few of those um, and they're decentralized as well like it's not organized by the by the people that organized the migration the migration was just to get people there once they're there that people have just been doing this but like I said a thousand people moved in 2007 and so they were kind of the early movers and they've been building this up since then so then I moved in 2017 10 years later and there's 10 years of groundwork already done um, and I get there and I go, oh, wow, all these people think like me and they, they want the same future that I want. So 
Um, yeah. That's all. Uh, is this uh, anarchi is this an anarchistic movement like Christiania or something like that? Um, I'm not totally familiar with that. I've heard that term. Um, I would say it's it's a bit more open than that than anarchist only. Uh, definitely, a lot of people are anarchists that move there. I would be hesitant to use that term just because a lot of different philosophies use the term anarchist to mean different things. Uh, that's why I prefer the term voluntarism because it really defines that I want voluntary exchange, I want consent, um, and I don't think all people that use the term anarchist want consent. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's. are you familiar with American libertarianism at all? As a, That's like the political side of that philosophy. Uh, it's just mainly smaller government. Government shouldn't be in charge of my personal decisions, um, all the way up to people that might say they're anarchist. Uh, and how do you achieve uh, consent? Uh, for example, in Christiania, it's like uh, uh, um, they hit each other until they have all the same, uh, <laughs> uh, until they all want to do the same <laughs> or something like that. And uh, is it democratic or something? No, it's totally decentralized. So it's up to the individual what you want to do with your life. And we're not trying to force anyone. Of course, there's an existing state government in New Hampshire, and we're also under the federal government. As far as within the movement, what people are doing is entirely open. Now, if you want to say at in this social club or in this project, how is it being done? Um, like for instance, in the mesh networking thing, it's we're right now we're just getting together. We don't have a lot of like big decisions to make. We're just doing a bunch of independent research and bringing it together and having discussions. Um, but for like a social club, yeah, there's there's maybe you could call it democratic. The one I'm a part of is has, has some kind of voting system and and whatnot, but that's kind of separate from the movement, right? And separate from the ideology. But yeah, we, we following this philosophy, I couldn't have a social club in which we we uh, came to consensus by hitting each other because <laughs> uh, part of the philosophy is don't hurt people. So. So it seems that your community is driven very strongly by I ideology. Um, and that could, it seems to me that it could be um, a very useful, um, let's say, um, I mean, if, if you're driven by ideology, you're willing to accept a lot of hardships, right? And overcome uh, lots of problems, technical problems, community problems. Does that actually work in, pra in, in practice? Like if you if you very think very strongly about uh, issues of internet censorship and stuff like that, does that drive the community members to want to deploy their own like networks like d does that work at all am i just like imagining that does that work in practice i mean i think so but uh, i mean not all these wi-fi communities are on the same ideology as no, me I'm and talking doing about it. your community specifically right right so yes in my community yes i think so that's i mean that's why there's so many people involved in cryptocurrency that's why people in my community actually use the currency like we're not just uh, uh, grabbing it to hold or some huddle, uh, but uh, using it, uh, people all over are, are trading with it um, because we want because of the, our ideology. Our ideology, yeah. Um, and I think the mesh network is going to be the same way. But like I said, it's just in the beginning right now. Um, but the interest I think comes from people seeing this is a decentralization. We're into decentralizing down to the individual, um, and this this fits our ideology. Thank you. So uh, I'm having a presentation in a couple of hours about the research project that we're doing here in, in Europe, and we are trying to categorize a lot of stuff that community network has been doing in, in the past years. So a lot of the things that you said, we have more or less tried to put them together. So we started describing how various networks work. For instance, there are networks that have uh, that include in their network the presence of small ISPs. So they have a mix of commercial and community-based uh, way of managing stuff. We are talking also about uh, applications. For instance, one thing that we basically ended to is that it, it's, it's better if you start with your community trying to understand what they need as, as an application. 
like uh, geeks normally they say okay I will set up this and then I will set up this and now it's and nobody will use it or uh, as soon as somebody uses it then you cannot actually handle the load to keep it up because for whatever reason so it fails and then nobody uses it anymore and and then everybody turns back to Facebook whatever so it, it, it's generally better to start a process with the community which takes a lot of time because you have to understand, you have to know the people, basically understand what they do and what they want to do with, with the network. And then you say at some point you pop out, say maybe we can do this for, I don't know, rural farmers that need an application to do whatever, to synchronize their log of uh, events during the year and put it together with Meteo or whatever. This works better than starting from the open source and just giving them the services. Because in the end, uh, if your network grows, and I hope it does, uh, you will need people to make the network sustainable. And as long as it's like a one-man show, technically, to maintain the thing, it will never scale. And w when you have the problem of scaling, because you are one person, or I don't know if you're your own alone, but there are just a group of geeks, a club of nerds that mm, run the whole thing, at some point you reach a scalability limit. And at that point you need a community that helps you. A community that maybe can finance uh, upgrades, a community that can be somehow involved in maintenance, a community that has connection to university schools or people that maybe are, have access to other geeks that want to do this. So you have to start from the community and then go, go up. That's what more or less the, lesson, the lessons that we learned. But we have all the things in the deliverables of the project and I will talk about more later. Awesome. I definitely will be there to check it out. I totally agree. And that's one of the problems I'm facing is that, uh, you know, I'm not new to the libertarian community there, but I am new to the to the rest of New Hampshire. You know, I've only been there for, m for a year, so I don't really know the needs of all my neighbors and, and whatnot. So that's part of the outreach that I have planned is to, to get to know the various uh, groups that I think would be interested in this type of thing um, and, and figure out if there is if this is a solution for them. If it solves any of their problems, if it's something that would or or would make their community better, um, and the answer might be no. You know, it, that's the saying that like you know, like you said, people build things and and they hope someone uses it, but it's easier to try to figure out beforehand before you build it and go, is the answer no to this anyways? Like, is it just no? Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be a few year proce process to really get to that point. Um, you know, I can get nodes going right now, but are people going to jump on them? Like, like we could we could set up a bunch of routers and get get a meshing, but is anyone going to use it, right? What's the point of doing that if I don't, like you're saying, if I don't know that it's going to be useful? Questions? Oh, are we done with questions? Yeah. So because we have uh, I think, yeah, right there is a question. Okay, I saw you asked for suggestion to services to try it in the local network. I would suggest to try RetroShare that works well on the internet, but works better in community network because it uses local connections if available. And it has file sharing, forums, channels, mails, and so on. It's like some way similar to Scuttlebutt, but has more histories of, of more services implemented already. All right. Anyone else? No more questions, okay. Thank you for having me, everyone. Looks like we're good. Thanks again.